Okay. Okay, well, I'm Irie. This is John. And our daughter, Julie, was first diagnosed with LAM in April 2007. Um, when we were first told she'd got this condition, she warned us not to go on the internet and look it up. Uh, I think she didn't want to frighten us. Uh, and we were very good. We didn't go on the internet. We didn't look it up. But we were going down, I think, to celebrate David's birthday, uh, April. And I remember standing in the kitchen. Uh, the children didn't know too much about it then. So it was a bit hush us, and we were whispering little words. So I said, uh, OK, Julie, so what are they going to do for you? And she said, Mum, there's no cure. Well, have you ever been hit in the back of your knees and really taken down like that. If I hadn't been hanging onto the kitchen sink at that time, I would think I would have hit the floor because I automatically thought, oh, they'll give her a pill. There'll be something. But then she told us that she was coming up to Nottingham to meet Professor Simon Johnson, who obviously we'd never heard of, but we know a lot about him now. And she did explain that uh, there would be fundraising to f and he was looking into finding a cure. So we set about talking to friends and family and thought, well, we're going to raise funds and we will help LAM Action. I'm going to hand over to John now, who will tell you a bit more of what we have been doing. Yes, as Irene said, it, 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 it hit us very badly and uh, friends and neighbours reassured us that there is medication. There's always medication, and it turned out that there was, thankfully. And uh, one thing which we felt comfortable with was to let our neighbours know. We felt we wanted people to know about uh, Julie's illness. And uh, the wider family, they were told, and very gently, um, we get messages back reassuring us that uh, they're there to support us. So the same year, we... Um, looked at fundraising and um, again due to the friendships around our village and the, the, the support from the family our first event was, re was um, in autumn of 2007 and we did an autumn fair and this um, was followed up by several events after that and we are indeed grateful very grateful to the people who live in our village of it's, it's amazing how generous they have been with their time. Irene will just mention uh, that there'll be a fundraising event, whether it be a table top, top sale or a, a presentation in the church. And they will be coming along with bottles to the bottle store, the cake for the cake store. And um, donations are coming very regular. Even yesterday, uh, we had donations for the sale we're having next week. So what we've done, we've put together some, um, some slides which show uh, the activities as well. There's one there. So this activity was one of the first we did in our village. And um, we, again, advertised. We even advertised in the local paper. We wanted the people of Peterborough to know and uh, the people in our village to know more about lamb. So we took over the village hall in the autumn, and apparently this was one of the last events in the village hall before it was demolished. <laughs> and we were very proud to be there. Uh, it, it would hold 100 <coughs> plus people, and it was taken down because the, of a need to rebuild for a new hall, which is now standing in its place. So these are the events, and uh, you can see the people volunteers who have helped us on the um, autumn fair and as I said we have tried to um, advertise and report back on the events we've done and this is the report back and you see in the picture Julie with the Anglican Regiment Band. Uh, the following year we did a, a Breath of Spring concert in the in the um, church and again we were um, we were fortunate to have a, a good number of volunteers of well-experienced um, people in, in music. 
There was um, singers, piano players, clarinet and saxophone. There was um, uh, violin. And Irene organized the bells at the bottles to play on that evening as well. I play handbells. Yeah. So, and um, that evening again was reported in our, in our magazine to, to tell everyone how much uh, we raised and to say thank you to them. At home, we have, a, we have tabletop sales, as Jan has mentioned. We try to do, do this once or twice a year. We try to pick sometime in the spring, on a, like, like we have a summer's day, which was good. Just before last Christmas, we had a concert in the church. where It was, it was named With Christmas in Mind. It was done about four weeks before Christmas as a lead up. And it went down very well. Our, our, in fact, was a part of the... The group in front of the um, front of the chancel, Irene's amongst them, and all the performers are there and part of the audience. And that one evening raised four hundred pounds. And it's for this that we feel comfortable and we feel that we are able to do something. And uh, knowing that um, Lamb Action has been working hard to be part of it for us is, in some ways making us feel better about what we're doing. I'd like to end by saying we have um, a sale coming up, and that's the poster on the right-hand side. Uh, next week, hopefully with good weather, we're going to have a tabletop sale. We named it a summer tabletop sale. Uh, we call it pre-loved, and that is second-hand. We're hoping to, um, to uh, give people uh, like uh, a bit like a car boot sale where, where they can come and browse, and hopefully they'll pick up something they all they are find interesting. There's a cake store, plans, we're having a raffle in Tombola. So thank you very much for allowing us to speak. Uh, is, is questions may be later, I don't know. So. I would just end by saying, if we've got any new lamb patients here, uh, or the families of any new lamb patients here, um, to begin with, yes, it is a shock, and, um, but you, you learn that you can live with lamb as Kelly is a, a fine example. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon everybody. Um, I haven't got a black dot on my badge like some of you guys, I just realised I probably need to sign up, but I do have the purple wristband, so hopefully I'll be uh, allowed in the club. Um, so good afternoon to you all, my name's James, and you have the pleasure of listening to me for a few minutes, and you might actually think, well, why have I stood here? Well, believe me, I was probably thinking the same, that too, the same thing too, um, but l thankfully I've got a, a very pushy wife who uh, volunteered me on a Saturday morning to stand here and talk to you, so thank you very much, Leanne. She may be watching online in between, obviously, feeding her, her new little baby. Um, so, Lam, from a pers uh, partner's perspective, um, looking around the room, I can see um, that there are plenty of partners and perhaps some parents and, and children too. And in preparation for this, obviously the scientific side of things would suggest that I should talk to everybody, get everybody's perspective and then deliver a summary, but clearly that's not going to be a possibility. So all I can do is talk to you about um, the way we've lived our life and uh, my own thoughts about things. Um, I'm also mindful of the fact that uh, our journey with Lamb is quite, quite young, and if we were to give the same presentation in 5, 10, 15 years' time, um, what I had to say may be completely different. So obviously just bear with us that it's a, it's a young journey into LAMP so far. So uh, the easiest way for me to, uh, to sum up my partner's, perspective, my, my partner's perspective of living with LAMP is probably give you a small insight into mine and Leanne's uh, life over the last two and a half years since Leanne was diagnosed in February 2013. So as I say, two and a half years. 2013 uh, was not a great year for, uh, for, for the family in general. Uh, however, if it wasn't for those reasons, it's, we probably wouldn't be with you guys today talking about LAM, um, as we probably wouldn't be in a position that we'd 
got a correct diagnosis for what was actually wrong with, uh, with Leanne. Um, because at this time, um, in 2013, a family member was receiving treatment at QE Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and whilst at that point, Leanne were, had a double neuro, pneumothorax, which was then treated by a military doctor one of the days that we visited uh, our relative. Um, the next day, she actually had another pneumothorax, and we were actually visiting the same hospital again. And, and going to the same a and department, we bumped into the same angry military doctor who'd rather unceremoniously carried out the aspirations the previous day. Um, luckily for us, because we bumped into the same doctor uh, on two uh, consequential days, um, the gentleman obviously realised that it wasn't perhaps the norm um, and, uh, and decided rather than just to fix the problem to start doing a little bit more investigation. Um, he obviously did CT scans and um, he obviously was slightly puzzled at the cysts on Leanne's lungs and decided to uh, circulate the imagery around the doctors at QE. And amazingly, there was a doctor there who had an interest in Lan. Uh, amazing what people get up to in their spare time, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> there we go. And, and thankfully, recognised the telltale signs. And so, as I say, thanks to a series of strange events, we got to the point quite early in, in the, uh, the process where Leanne realised what was actually wrong with her. Um, so, as I said to you before, it was um, February the 14th, uh, 2013, Valentine's Day, and clutching a printout from Wikipedia, a junior doctor decided to deliver the news uh, to, uh, to Leanne of what her illness was. I, I know you obviously mentioned about not going online. Sadly, the junior doctor didn't have a clue what Leanne was. She'd just got the message to tell the patient this is what it was, and, and the great way of delivering it was actually to print out that Wikipedia page and hand it over, which was brilliant. Um, I'm assuming that most people in the room have probably had a little look at that page and the reading is certainly not pretty and we were obviously deeply uh, in shock at that point. Um, Leanne didn't realise at this point actually, uh, back in 2013, that I'd actually got an engagement ring sat at home at my mum's house waiting for the right moment. Um, and with that in mind, armed with the Wikipedia facts, uh, I couldn't quite believe the way life was panning out. So I obviously got lots of plans, met Leanne, wanted to have children, all those kind of things. Um, and obviously it really felt like uh, things were crumbling around you know when you get those kind of facts obviously subsequent meetings with Professor Johnson uh, gave us a completely uh, different perspective on uh, on life with Lamb from that but the first thing most people do is is go online and get those daunting facts um, as I did say it was Valentine's Day 2013 that we got uh, given this diagnosis and unfortunately for me I'd actually already been out shopping for that night's meal um, before we'd been given a diagnosis and never once to put my foot in it. I accidentally didn't pick a particularly great cut of meat for dinner that evening. That is the genuine truth. Um, I opened the fridge and went to put the dinner in. I thought, James, what have you done? So uh, there we go. So as living with lamb, most people will realise that... Um, People say, what's wrong with you? Uh, and you almost feel like a bit of a fraud because there's no kind of external signs initially. Um, and you, so you try to tell people what's wrong with you and they've never heard of it. And as they say, you almost feel like a bit of a fraud. If you told people you've got something more common wrong with you or your leg was falling off or whatever, people give you that sympathy. But it's a little bit more, a bit more subtle with lamb. And, uh, and perhaps people then take the time to look online and, and, and realise uh, what's going on. So, um, yes, yeah, so it is a bit of a strange feeling um, the way it is. But the, the hardest thing for me personally with the early stages of living with Lamb was obviously the subtleties in life. We all have things that we like to do. So we've obviously got our dogs and walking the dogs, as you can see there, they don't look like they've done much more. They might have been for a long walk on that particular day. Uh, but uh, we like to walk our dogs. But, you know, you, you start going up a slope and you realise your wife's out of breath and... You know, you know, you realise she just carried a, a relatively small basket of washing up the stairs and she's, you know, catching her breath on the landing or, um, I don't know, we, we wanted to book a week's holiday in Salcombe and we normally like to book slightly up the hill and so you've got views of the sea, uh, sort of the estuary and whatnot and this time we, we decided to book on the flat so it's easier to get around and, uh, and bits and pieces, you know, things like that, you know, worrying about booking a foreign holiday in case you have a collapsed lung closer to the date and all of a sudden you can't fly. So, you know, things like that really aren't the kind of things you should be thinking about when you're 30 and trying to get on with your life. Um, you know, they just shouldn't be the issues you're, you're looking to consider, but, you know, that's where we were and that's what we were having to do. 
Uh, Leanne, however, is one tough cookie, and together uh, what we decided to do was to live life uh, to the limit of what Leanne can manage, despite lamb. Um, so we just carried on setting about achieving all of the things that we wanted to do. Um, and obviously the strangest thing about living with lamb is that, um, as you guys mentioned, there's all this medication that can help manage lamb. Um, there's nothing that can just cure you or, or you can't have an operation or just make it all go away. Um, or, you know, obviously, hopefully things will change from that perspective. But the one thing we felt that, um, yes, that was, a, that was obviously a big problem. Um, and it also can be quite a hard mental aspect of things um, for you to overcome. So in order for us to feel like Leanne wasn't just lying back and letting lamb, lamb take over her life and her body, uh, what we decided to do was obviously get on uh, with fundraising and try and help Lamb uh, as much as we can. And we decided to do this in many ways, from charity nail days at Leanne's uh, <coughs> local beauty salon, cake sales around local shops, raffles. Um, I threw my hat in the ring with a... Uh, I think eight half marathons, and uh, and probably the most impressive thing of that was on the eighth half marathon was when uh, Leanne and I, uh, there we are coming up Broad Street in Birmingham, uh, ran the event together. Um, amazingly, because she got lamp, um, she did the whole thing without stopping, ran all the way around in two hours and twenty four minutes, and uh, great job. So I didn't stop once. So. Um, I can, as you can imagine, Simon uh, wasn't particularly impressed when we told him about what we'd been up to when we went to our next consultation. Um, he definitely sighed. Yeah, jealous, yeah. So at the time, was like, 2 hours 24, that's unbelievable. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't, overly, it wasn't overly impressed, but uh, there we are. Um, you'll be glad to uh, know that the wedding ring did finally make it out of the safekeeping of my mom's house. And the next... Uh, phase in our plan was the wedding and hopefully if lucky uh, start a, a family thereafter um, it was at this point we did start to get a few choices with regards to lamb and, and Simon was keen for, for Leanne to have a pleurodesis um, however as sure Simon knows uh, Leanne's a bit of a stubborn bugger and wasn't so keen um, she likes to plan things Leanne does and our wedding was in June and she needed to get ready for that dress fittings and, and such like and uh, and, and, and quite simply, having a pleurodesis, bear in mind we were getting married in the south of France, uh, just wasn't on the agenda. It hadn't, you know, she hadn't got the memo about that and uh, she didn't have time for it. Um, but it doesn't matter how positive you want to be about a disease, um, when you've got something like lamb, it can raise its head at any point and bite back. Uh, and that happened for us in Easter 2014. Um, so we were seven and a half weeks before the wedding uh, and Leanne had a, quite a bad collapsed lung. It was fully collapsed and it just wouldn't reinflate, um, which obviously brought a little tear to uh, little Leanne's eye. Um, the only solution for this problem at this point was to have the pleurodesis that she, she really didn't want. Um, so only seven and a half weeks before the big day, which was abroad, uh, Leanne was going under the knife for surgery uh, for something that we understand, understood at the time takes about 12 weeks to recover from. So um, it wasn't brilliant. Um, obviously, after the operation, uh, the album wasn't in a great way. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I really thought the wedding uh, was in doubt. I thought we were going to have to cancel. And I wasn't looking forward to telling all those people who'd obviously booked their flights and accommodation. But, uh, you know, the health of the is the most important thing. Um, uh, looking for the me, uh, I did obviously choose the most determined woman in the world to marry me and on schedule we did make it to the chapel on time uh, for the wedding and everybody had an absolutely fantastic day. Uh, you wouldn't believe, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so you wouldn't believe that was seven and a half weeks after her uh, operation really, she did absolutely, uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, in hindsight, the pleurodesis has been a major help uh, with regards to the mental aspects of living with lamb. Um, one of the constant worries and potent, uh, for us was obviously the potential of a collapsed lung uh, and the impact that has on your plans um, were greatly reduced and you really can just get on with life. I mean, we always got on with life in general, uh, but you can do that now. With, we, could do, we can do that now without the contingency of worrying about a collapsed lung. I appreciate the pleurodesis doesn't completely rule it out, but it certainly, for us, uh, significantly reduced the risk as Leanne was having uh, quite a substantial amount of collapsed lung during that period of time. Um, also, the pleurodesis did help with the next plan of ours, which was obviously to start a family. Um, 
And again, looking back at that doomed Wikipedia page, I thought children really perhaps wouldn't be an option for me and Leanne. Uh, and if we did decide to have a child, I, I really thought that Leanne would really suffer during pregnancy. So not long after the wedding, Leanne and I found uh, that we would be having a bundle of joy. And on the 7th of May, we were due to have uh, our little baby due. Um, and that's uh, a little first little scan that came through. Um, the pleurodesis did, however, mean that pregnancy was relatively uh, plain sailing in the grand scheme of things. Leanne was lucky enough to go um, through uh, the pregnancy without any side effects from Lamb, apart from obviously extra shortness of breath. Um, however, on saying that, having seen the presentations last year, and I'm not sure if anybody here, for the people who were here last year, obviously saw the presentations about pregnancy, um, you know. The, the relatively smooth pregnancy that Leanne had isn't, isn't the, you know, she was very lucky, so, uh, so we are aware of that. Um, but, um, uh, so that's that. Uh, the, da, 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 I've lost where I was. Um, But anyway, so yes, due on the 7th of May, um, a little bit early, as you've already seen, she's already made a star appearance, she's born on the 21st of April, uh, and as a result of uh, a cluster feeding at the moment, Leanne is struggling to make it today, but as I say, hopefully she's uh, watching online. So together since um, 20, February 2013, Leanne and I have lived a bit of a roller coaster with Lam. Um, obviously, the diagnosis originally, um, as you say, it makes you fall like someone's back, hit you on the back of the knees and you're going to fall down. Um, obviously, reading those lovely Wikipedia pages, uh, followed by the elation of Leanne running a half marathon, looking forward to our wedding, then back down to the pleurodesis and thinking the wedding's going to get cancelled, and obviously getting pregnant and having our amazing baby. Now, the reason... <laughs> Now, the reason I've told you about our journey for Lamb over the last two and a half years is to emphasise my message of living with Lamb from a perspective point of view, from a, from a partner's perspective. Um, Lamb is obviously a disease that we all in this room wish we either didn't have, or our wife didn't have, or our, our parent didn't have, or our, or our daughter didn't have. Um, but unfortunately, we do have the disease. However, you still have to live life and push on within, the lim within your limits. Uh, Leanne thought she could manage a half marathon. I didn't, but she did. And guess what? She ran one. Uh, Leanne was convinced she could have a natural birth. Again, other people didn't, and, but she did, and, and she did. And, and so, you know, that's what you've got to believe. And we all, as partners with, uh, with Lamb, at different st with, so we all have partners with Lamb at different stages, and it's currently affecting our partners in different ways. So all we can do as partners is just to be there for our wives, support them in whatever they, whatever they want to do, and ensure that they push themselves to the limit of their current physical capabilities and ensure that the disease doesn't hold them back from achieving their goals. Is that better? I'm Fiona Scora. I'm the daughter of Pete and Marie Hutchinson. Um, and as you can see, I've had the same hairdresser since I was four years old. Um, Mum was diagnosed 24 years ago when I was approaching my second birthday. Um, I now have my own daughter who's coming up 18 months old. So when I think back as a mum now, it must have been heartbreaking to hear at that time that she had this disease and the prognosis at the time I believe was that she could expect about 10 years quality life and that was it. So to think that your child would grow up without you would, would have been heartbreaking. Um, and also terrifying, um, my daughter runs around my house at 100 miles an hour and destroys anything that she can reach. So to be breathless and trying to keep up with her would have, you know, would have, been, um, would have been quite a job. Um, children at that age don't tend to question things, so I've never known any different than to have a mum with lamb, and I've never really questioned why things in our life were different. Um, 
my own daughter now, if I tell her that a strawberry is red, she believes me that a strawberry is red. Um, she doesn't question why Grandma Marie has an oxygen tube on her face. It's just the way it is. Um, and if you want to know how lamb affected my, my childhood, the answer is that it didn't really. Um, and that was purely because mum didn't allow it to. Um, mum still worked, we still went on family holidays, we still had arguments about boyfriends, we still argued about me watching trashy TV, um, all the normal things that go on in a household. Um, I understood that my dad was the one who I went to for active things that I wanted to do. So he was the one that took me hiking and swimming, and he was the one that took me on roller coasters at theme parks, um, which I understood that my mum couldn't do with me. But I understood that mum was the one to go to if I needed help with my algebra, or you know, she was the one who taught me how to cross stitch and she would sit and paint with me, which I hope Dad won't mind admitting that he couldn't do either. Um, I think all children go through a stage where they resent the choices that their parents make for them. It's kind of um, one of those rites of passage that you go through as a teenager to want whatever it is you haven't got. I did look at my friends getting on a plane and they would be in Spain within two hours and be at a lovely sunny resort. And there was a time in my teenage years where I did resent the fact that we would have to get on a ferry and then there would be a two-day drive to get to where we wanted to be because mum couldn't just get on a plane. But actually, I wouldn't have done some of the amazing things that I did in some fantastic countries if we hadn't have gone on those holidays. Um, I wouldn't have met the real Santa in Lapland and I wouldn't have fed a reindeer out of the window of the car because you couldn't have done that if we just had to get on a plane. Um, although I stand by the statement that my childhood was very normal, um, it would be dishonest of me to stand here and say that there weren't any differences. Um, Mum was advised not to have any more children after me, so I have no brothers and sisters. Um, I had to take on responsibilities around the house at quite a young age um, to help Dad out with the housework. Um, I have to say at this point that Mum was still working full time, she wasn't just being lazy. Um, so me and Dad took on a lot of the, the responsibilities around the house. Um, and I hope Mum won't admit me saying that there was also a few occasions where she needed help um, with things like getting up the stairs or getting ready in the morning. Um, when she was very, very tired and um, I needed to help her out. Saying that, I'm a great believer that all your experiences, good or bad, make you the person that you are. And looking back, I can see that I wouldn't be me without going through those things. Not having siblings forced me into making friends wherever I went. So on holiday, I always made friends with the other kids on the campsite. And actually, one of the girls that I met when I was seven I'm still in contact with, and she came to my wedding a few years ago. Um, it also helps me in my job. I'm now a PA, and it's important for me to be able to go up and talk to anyone. So being forced to make friends wherever I went really helped with that. Um, helping around the house meant that I was independent, and I can look after myself. When I went to university, I could cook a decent meal for myself whereas my friends were living off beans on toast or fish fingers and ketchup, which was something that my, uh, one of my roommates, that's all she ate, because that's all she knew how to cook. Um, when I got married, my husband was particularly impressed that I knew how to iron a shirt. And uh, now with my own daughter, I am actually encouraging her from 18 months old to help me put things in the washing machine already, partly because it keeps her occupied, but also because I think you need to be able to look after yourself. Um, looking after mum made me have empathy and compassion with those who have disabilities. It's also given me a confidence in my own body. Um, things in my own body are now starting to fall apart and it doesn't bother me um, because I know from watching her that 
no matter what fails in your body, it's your mental attitude that counts, and you just get on with it. Um, to end, I just kind of want to leave you with the message that no one's family life is perfect. Um, it might appear that way on the surface with some families, but I promise you it's not. Every family has its constraints and its compromises, whether that's due to a money situation or a conflict or a health matter. But as a mother myself now, I can say that you can only do what you think best for your kids. And regardless of the lamb, I think I turned out all right. And um, I think mum did a great job and I love you very much. <laughs>